You know, I always tell people like, there's two things you don't mess with. You don't mess with someone's kids and you don't mess with someone's money. And we were literally doing Whoa, both that intersection. in real time. Layden Merrifield, what's up? How are you? Dude, I'm so glad um, that we could do this. We're actually sitting in your building, downtown Kelowna. We are. We are. The yeah. Innovation Center, uh, incredible, um, you know, part of the tech community you've built here in Kelowna. Um, all started with Club Penguin, which I'm assuming you've been doing for so long, or that you've, it's been so long since you've done it, you've probably told this story so many times, but I gotta, I, I gotta ask, because I believe the number was close to a billion kind of outcome. Uh, yeah, well, it was 650 million with earnouts and things like yeah. that, and we, we ended up getting a good chunk of it, uh, but not all of it, so it ended up underneath there. And I mean, for people that think that's crazy, I mean, you guys didn't have to sell, because my understanding is you guys were incredibly profitable. Yeah, yeah, we, we were fortunate. I mean, we bootstrapped it, and we kept things so razor thin. Uh, in terms of costs that we ended up uh, profitable after three months. Yeah. Um, and I mean, not huge at the time, obviously, but but because we were so tight, uh, you know, and then we ended up within about six months, um, you know, hiring and, and we went from four employees to 180 employees in 18 months. And uh, yeah, and then, and then we got to this place where we didn't have the infrastructure to keep up. And we needed to, uh, we wanted to diversify, but I didn't, I had a young family. I didn't really want to have to run around the world looking at real estate and offices to lease and things like that. And to so, scale it up. Yeah. 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 And we were, we were, and it, and it was critical for me because of our mission of taking care of kids and giving them a safe place online. It was critical that we honor that globally. We had kids playing globally, but we didn't have the infrastructure to be able to support them all the same. Mm. And I didn't like that dispar disparity. I didn't want to create that. Um, and so we had to expand globally. We had to put offices in different parts of the world, both from a time zone perspective and a language perspective. And, um, and so, you know, we were looking for a company that had that infrastructure. Was Disney the, I mean, when you think of like who would be the absolutely best partner to help deliver on that, you know, in regards to like translations and international and just horsepower, were they the only option for you guys or? No, I mean, it was a huge process. There's a, there's a whole bidding process. Um, Disney wasn't even the highest bidder. Uh, so if it was purely about cash or purely about the exit, yeah. we could have done better. Um, uh, I, again, we're happy, <laughs> no complaints, but, but it wasn't, when I say it wasn't just about the money, it really, it really wasn't about the money. Um, mm. uh, for us, it really was an infrastructure play more than anything. And, um, and I wanted to see the company reach a billion dollars, at least from an LTV perspective. And, and, uh, and that was my goal pre Disney. That was my goal post Disney. And it's one of the reasons I stuck around for five years to make it happen. Dude. I remember I was going to, uh, I would have been 20, 19, 20 in, um, taking a programming class with a guy named Andrew and he had young kids and they were playing on club penguin. And I said, what is it? And he goes, my kids are, and it was built in flash, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Like I'm a bit of a nerd. So action script. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. And, uh, he was just like, they're addicted to this thing. And when, and I said, oh, you pay for it? And he goes, oh yeah, you have to like buy stuff and in-game. And this is early days. Like today it's kind of normal. We have Roblox, we have all these examples, but you know, go back. Like, cause I know then there was Dave, which he's the older guy. And yeah. then Lance, who I've, I've spent time with. Um, what, did, how did that founding team? Cause it definitely feels like it was lightning in a bottle. Yeah. Like yeah. there was a moment in time where this happened. Go, go to those early days and, and tell us how that came to be. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously the people played a key role. Um, Lance and Dave and myself are, are very different. I mean, truly we'll still, you know, hang out and grab a coffee once in a while, but even when we were in the thick of it, even when it was all going crazy, you know, we'd, we'd kind of meet up at a dinner cause we had had to be there for some sort of function, but we didn't socialize together. You know, there, there, it was not the like, you know, bro fest, like frat boy, we're going to go start a company together. Cause we just like hanging out all the time. Um, this was really truly a serendipitous meeting of very different strengths, very different weaknesses, but a very unified philosophy and a, and a and really a unified value system. And Dave brought a lot of that together with within the previous company that we started in. Um, the the act. Was that back. an agency of sorts? Yeah, or? it was a marketing agency. Okay. So we did website design and development, uh, video, you know, video um, uh, design. I, I my background was in design, so that's kind of where I came into this. Um, 
And Dave was like, hey, can you hold down the fort? I'm going to Europe to meet a bunch of our European clients. We were working with John Deere and a bunch of others kind of out of Europe. And, um, and uh, so, so I did. And I was kind of, I was meeting with all the team. I'd only been there a few months at the time. I was sitting down with Lance. He started showing me some of these little mini games he was working on. He kind of had the tech background and had the passion around creating the games. Um, and for me, from a leadership perspective and a community perspective, which was my passion, we both got creatively talking about this. And it was like, well, what if you took these same little mini games and we started bringing them together? And he kind of showed some different ideas that he had. And, and then when Dave came back from Europe, we literally were ready with our letter of resignation to say, hey, we got You guys go. were going to bounce. We, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. There was never a thought of doing it. Well, we, we were hoping we could, but we're yeah. like... Dave, if not, we're doing Dave's this. Dave's been building this company for 20-some years. Yeah. Like, we're about to say, hey... We want to stop all the things that we're doing with this company, with your company right now. And we're going to, we got to go do this thing. So we pitched him. It took about two hours. And at the end of the pitch, uh, he looked at us and he said, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. <laughs> None of this makes any sense to me, but I've never seen either, either of you this passionate before. And so let's figure out how to do it here. And, and he just said, Lane, uh, every dime of profit that you can generate from this existing company, you can pour into Club Penguin. Um, all your time and effort around that, you can pour into it, obviously. Lance, you can go full-time on Club Penguin right now. And whatever you guys can sc scrape together from your own funds, we'll use to hire a couple of people, a couple of artists, and, and some folks to support Lance. Uh, so that's what we did. So Took he out. donated his company as the seed. As a seed I capital. didn't know that. Yeah. I thought it was like a separate thing. No, he basically said, and so, you know, I was almost like moonlighting with Penguin. I was working my ass off every day trying to, you know, drum up more business and, and negotiate contracts and things to try and eke out as much margin as I could from every single job, knowing that that margin could be reinvested back in. And then we went, you know, I went down to the bank, took out a line of credit on my house. And, uh, dude, you went all in, we went all in we young all family in. Yeah. line of credit. Your wife was, did you I, tell her? Yeah. I just, Oh yeah, of course I had yeah, to sit down she and might we, to. we basically said, Hey, we might move back into an apartment if this all goes to shit. Wow. And what was that rocket ship timeline? Uh, well, like how quick did you get to revenue? Yeah. So, and then how did so it scale up? We, it was about uh, nine to 10 months in production. Kind of, we had about three or four people that were working on it. You know, we were paying them part time. It was like hourly. Mm -hmm. They were all working harder than what we could afford to pay them. They were, you know, they were passionate about it, excited as well. Um, uh, Lance had been at it full time, obviously, and we were just we were literally reaching the point where we were running out of funds because, you know, our, our money, the, Lance and I put in equal amounts from our houses. That money was starting to run low. Um, the rest of the company was kind of supporting, but not enough to pay all these folks. So we said we got to turn on the revenue. We always knew it was going to be subscription, even from the beginning, because one of our core beliefs and core values was around not advertising to young kids, you know, mm -hmm. especially when they don't understand the difference between what's an ad and what's not. And so, um, so we knew we weren't going to go ad based and we knew, uh, we had to somehow pay for this, which thing. is quite unique back then. Cause Super everybody unique. just had banners. This is pre Netflix. This mm -hmm. is, I mean, we were mocked openly by the, by the media. In fact, I, I still have a couple of articles that literally said, you know, they were reviewing the site and they said, you know, it's, it's neat. They really seem to make a nice game here. Uh, eventually, they're going to grow up and realize that you can't make money on the internet without advertising. So this whole subscription thing is going to crash and burn. Um, <laughs> because and, and the only model we had, ironically, was there's a couple of online games like World of Warcraft and things that were charging a subscription. And then we use the analogy of like HBO. We're like, well, there's free TV with ads, but people are willing to pay for premium TV without ads. Maybe they'll maybe they'll do the same with this, you know, on behalf of their kids, because it's really the whole goal was to say, let's try and give kids a safe walled environment that was ad free, because that's what we wanted for our own kids. Um, looking back now, those same types of reporters who were mocking us are like, how did you know the, you know, the, the trend of uh, subscriptions so yeah. early? And it's like we didn't know anything. We just knew. We, we had right. We had limited solutions and we and we wanted to do the right thing by the kids. And how do you get the word out once you launch? Because nine months, not a long time to build. I think people wait too long to monetize. I mean, the fact that you monetize out of the gate, um, how do you get the initial user base going? Yeah, so we, um, thankfully, Lance had donated. Uh, see, again, this is where it's like <laughs> paying it forward, doing the right thing, karma, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Lance had donated a few of his mini games that he had made over the years uh, in Flash to 
this young guy, young developer out in the UK who is trying to start a collection of flash games, like a website dedicated yeah. to this stuff. And, uh, and he put out, put out the call to anyone who he could find on the internet who had made a flash game saying, Hey, I can't pay you now, but I'll pay you down the road. Once I start generating revenue, would you donate a game? Most people just ignored him, obviously, you know, yeah. Hey, I, I'm not going to give this away for free. Lance was like, listen, I'll give it to you now, but pay me an extra, you know, hundred bucks for it down the road or something, uh, whenever you can. And so that's what he did. And this was like four or five years before this fast forward to we're you know, we launched this thing. We're seeing the uptick. We, we did a closed beta of about three or 4,000 kids that had turned into 20,000 kids inside of about two to three weeks. And parents did not spend money on kids back then. No, no. And certainly not on the internet. I mean, no, even on the internet, like where did you get your merchant account? <laughs> I mean, this is the thing that people take for granted that yeah. we have Stripe today. Yeah. You like know I remember what? getting a merchant account in early 2000s and it's like, the bank said no at first. Oh yeah. We, yeah, I probably talked about seven or eight different banks and, and companies before we could get it sorted. I mean, those are the types of things that it's easy to take for granted. Even the even the um, authentication, like setting up the accounts, we were doing manually during that beta. So I was literally getting Outlook email with requests for an account and we were having to go into the database, manually set up an account and send a kid their credentials. 20,000 accounts? Yeah, yeah, inside of like the first, you know, I think it was three, four weeks. Um, and so, I mean, we were just scrambling. I mean, it was all nighters, nonstop. We lived on like pizza and Coca-Cola and just, you know, and just knocked ourselves out trying to make this thing happen. Cause we knew we had something special. We, we knew that, you know, over time, eventually the big, the big, Big guys were going to figure it out. The Nickelodeon, the Disney, uh, they all There's had moment in they time. had products in the market, and yeah. we we thought, okay, we've got this limited amount of time. It's also why we were so secretive about it. Um, so, like, we had an agreement among the three of us: we're not going to even when we were making money. Like, we we started paying ourselves. I remember dividends. you telling me this, where you you guys agreed, I'm nobody's buying a car, no one's buying a car, no fancy. one's buying a house, no one's doing any. There's no upgrades to your lifestyle. Yeah, um, I ended up having to, I, I ended up needing a car anyway. And so I got like the entry level Lexus, the cheapest one I could find because I, you know, it was like a Toyota or whatever anyway. And, uh, and that was about as extravagant as I got. And, um, you know, we turned down Business Week, we turned down TechCrunch, we turned down, you know, every reporter out there because we didn't want to go run around and, and say how successful we were. We were private, so no one knew. They were looking at ComScore. Because and you were scared that somebody's going to pick up. Because we knew we had compete. something special. I mean, yeah. we were, it was. So it, when you start getting these emails from reporters that are hearing word on the street, you're yeah. a little nervous, like, hey. Well, we were popping up in ComScore. And oh. so, um, and ComScore wasn't very accurate back then. So, and there would be mistakes. So we would get an email saying, hey, like, you guys whoa. have rocketed up to like top 10 kids' sites. Um, uh, you know, is this true and how and what's going on here? Um, so I do need to pause real quick because I forgot to, I yeah, forgot I to finish the story. How did you get that distribution? Yeah, yeah. so I'll finish the distribution one and then we'll get back to the reporters. So in the distribution, um, fast forward then to Club Penguin, we knew we had something special. We had this beta. We were ready to go, you know, ready to open it up to the public. And um, and we reached out to this this friend of Lance's who he'd given these games to years earlier, it's who now site. is running Miniclip. Oh, which no was about way. 50, which had about 50 million uniques a yeah. month um, of just kids of our prime audience going to this thing. So we reach out to him and say, hey, listen, we'd like we want to put together, you know, um, and, and he'd only ever hosted these like tiny little one off games before. Um, and so we went to him and said, hey, we want to we've got something kind of bigger, more complicated. We worked out a rev share agreement that was, um, you know, pretty generous for him at the time, but he also had a massive distribution. And we thought, listen, we've got the margin because we kept things so tight. We kept our costs so low that we could afford to do it. And, um, uh, you know, and, and, and then he started to turn on the tap and, and he would only like open it up to, you know, every hundredth user, like, like it kind of show up on the yeah, list, yeah, like 10%, bit. 12%. And, and it was funny cause he came to us and, and talk about this paranoia of time, like this moment in time that we didn't want to lose. Uh, uh, he said, it usually takes the average game about three to four months to go full audience because we just, we, we, we crashed. Yeah, yeah. And I said, we're going to do it in a month. And he's like, it's not, not happening, but good luck. Yeah. And it was like literally, I think, uh, five weeks or something. We were like one week past what we wanted to. Um, and we had the full audience on there and, and it was going nuts. And from and, that and point And he on, wouldn't have taken this conversation had Lance not... No, he definitely wouldn't have featured us the way he did. No. And, and, uh, and, 
and or it would have been a more aggressive contract or 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 yeah, a whole lot of you know i mean it, in the end when we were cutting him checks for 4 or 5 million dollars a month pretty he was pretty happy about it <laughs> um but um but he but he deserved it i mean you know he took a risk on us the risk paid off and and those were checks i was happy how to did cut. you keep the servers from not melting cuz back then this is bare metal you're in a server room they I'm melted assuming. a lot they melted a lot i mean we we had a team that was just dedicated to it and frankly we were hacking these servers cuz we were pulling off web servers to run that were used to running websites and we yeah. were we were trying to like hack them um into these socket servers and yeah. a typical socket server will will deliver packets of information and like you know it'll be like a 15 second connection a 20 second connection while the website's downloading yeah. onto your local device um our socket server connections were like milliseconds because we couldn't we had to just like deliver it and then drop it it was like and so then the penguin would move on the screen to wherever they clicked and then they click something else move it and drop it and uh, we even brought we brought in consultants from IBM one time because we couldn't keep the servers up because even after even after we had all, all of Miniclip's audience on there that was great but we were also growing independently as well um, and so we brought in these consultants from IBM they sat down they dug through the servers they were going to help us scale and um, after like two or three days of digging into it they literally said we're going to give you your money back like thanks but they couldn't solve it we can't help you the people that sold you the hardware you they guys can't. you guys are using this stuff in ways we've never seen before we don't know frankly how they're standing up as well as they are and uh, you know let us know what you find out and so we we're like all right we'll just keep figuring it out ourselves and thankfully we 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 really had worked hard to build a community and to build that community sense. It's one of the reasons why Club Penguin, you know, just last week was trending again on Twitter. Like it still, still has that passionate fan base because we really cared about them and they really cared about us. And as a result, they were very patient. When servers would crash, we wouldn't get flooded with angry emails. We get flooded with like cheering us on. Like, good luck, guys. We know you're working hard. We know you're and 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 that's, you know, nowadays when I consult and try to help other companies about building an online community and building their um, building building their brand um, within a community. It's one of the things I talk about all the time is to not create an adversarial relationship with your community, not hold back information, not try to hide things from your community. Be as transparent, as vulnerable, as open as you possibly can, and you will endear yourself far more than if you try to sculpt the perfect message and hold back. And I mean, politicians are learning this now. I mean, everyone is. Yeah. But back then, companies were, I mean, we're li literally Corporate. dealing with like AOL yeah. Yeah. that would like, you know, try to trick people into not canceling their accounts. And those, and those recordings were going online and we're listening to this stuff going, Oh God, like someone's got to do it differently. It's one of the reasons why we had actual humans doing customer support. You know, we had yeah. 300 people around real the world, people. Doing, real people doing customer care. I mean, and now I watch YouTube and their debacle with their algorithms and the way that kids have been frankly harmed Revolt, in some ways, yeah. um, by having content put in front of them that shouldn't be because, like, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm an, as much of a nerd as anyone, and I love technical solutions, but there's some of the stuff that human just powered. requires human power. Go back to the, um, the, the media people. Oh, what, yeah. How do, you, how do you hold them at bay? We, li well, we lied to them. Yeah. We li when they would contact us and say, listen, your comm score numbers are through the roof. You guys are clearly doing something. What's going on? We'd be like, yeah, you know, we're trying to get a hold of comm score. We're trying to figure out what's it's going totally on. It's totally wrong. But it's, it's just not accurate. What I'd say is it's not accurate. It's just not accurate. It's okay. not accurate. And they would assume, yeah, well, you know, it's not accurate. It wasn't accurate. We were actually outperforming Way better score, than they were reporting. But we didn't want to tell anyone. We kept it secret for over a year before finally people were like, okay. And, what, and was, was there a cultural aspect of it as well that you wanted to kind of represent the lean and mean team in regards to like not disclosing the level of, uh, revenue, um, or was it just more of like, hey, we don't want anybody to figure this out? It was a little bit of, uh, it's a little bit of all of the above. Yeah. You know, we we had started this thing for our kids. We were hoping that it would be sustainable. Like literally, we had goal sheets that were like could be sustainable or self sustaining inside of like two years. And so when it was profitable in three months, you know, we were hiring. We were we were. I mean, part of why we grew so quickly is because as the as the experience was growing, as the user base was growing we felt an incredible responsibility to take care of them properly. I mean, it's kids, dude. It's a different mm -hmm. game. A lot of people... You know, I always tell people, like, there's two things you don't mess with. You don't mess with someone's kids, and you don't mess with someone's money. And we were literally doing oh, both. Oh, that intersection. In real time. You Typically, you have, like, your, your champion, your influencer, and your decision maker. Yeah. And our whole world was created around the fact that our kids were the users, but kids didn't have credit cards. Their parents had the credit cards. So the parents were ultimately the decision makers. So the kids could influence, they could champion, they could promote it. 
but the parents had to be the final authority. And so we had to keep both happy. Um, and as a result, it's one of the reasons why for us, when, even when I talk about things like data and, and all of that, you know, like we, we had, we had incredible sums of data. It was all anonymized by our choice again, because we didn't need it. We didn't need the data for advertising reasons. Um, and so our only objective was to be, was to, to align ourselves with parents as much as we could and to justify every single month why that, you know, it was a good spend. why that credit card was being charged mm -hmm. and why it was a good spend. And, um, and we got so focused on that. We used to have a, we used to have a, uh, a saying around the office. In fact, we even, I had it on my wall at one point. If it doesn't matter to an eight year old, it doesn't matter. And anytime we'd be like, okay, well maybe we should do this and maybe we should do this. And maybe you literally like anyone from the brand new, you know, entry level person all the way through the ranks could say, Hey, how does this matter to an eight year old? And so when I'd be invited to go keynote the gamer develop, game developers conference in Austin, Texas, I'd ask myself, how does this matter to an eight year old? No eight year old's going to be in attendance. No eight year old's going to meet, the you know, read the press media yeah. later. Parents aren't going to read that media. I'd rather go talk to a mommy blogger conference where I can talk to them about how much we value safety, how we're taking care of their kids. That is a worthwhile effort because that then we can help that eight year old convince their parents it's worthwhile. Mm. But for me to go toot my own horn, for me to go just do it, you know, really what it would have come down to is just ego. And, uh, and ego wasn't going to grow my business. Dude, having that level of awareness at such a young age, early in your entrepreneurial career is pretty different. As you know, meeting so many entrepreneurs that literally, you know, easily distracted, you know, you know, kind of high on their own supply sometimes of their early success totally is, is really cool. And then after that, you know, you have this huge success. A lot of people decide to maybe go find a, you know, private island somewhere and, and <laughs> chill. And you decide to double down on your community, yeah. build this incredible building in downtown Cologne, the Innovation Center, um, you know, your essentially your investment vehicle wheelhouse. Why? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I used to have a saying that if you weren't my kids or Mickey Mouse, you weren't going to see me. And I would say that because I said no to everything, you know, even after the, after the deal, after the acquisition, whether it was a foundation or a fundraiser or whatever, I mean, that happens and you're on everybody's list. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I would send the check, but I wouldn't ever be there. I wouldn't deliver it. I wouldn't go to the event. I wouldn't go to the, and, and I wouldn't, God knows I would never, you know, like <laughs> hold yeah, the giant check the and do the thumbs yeah. up and do the thing. I just didn't have time. And I was so focused on, on that goal of continuing to grow this business at Disney at Disney. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when I finally decided to leave, it was increasingly difficult for me to do my job remotely. My family was here. I was traveling. I realized, um, two things. Number one, it's hard to navigate the politics of a massive corporation from a distance. Cause you're always kind of outcomed and outnumbered. So even when you're trying to advocate for something and move an idea forward, uh, when I wasn't there, I was losing ground. And so then I always wanted to be there, you know, there being like Burbank or LA. LA. Yeah. Um, I always wanted to be there to help move the ball down the field. Uh, but then every time I was there, I wasn't with my kids and that was killing me. And in fact, I literally was in Australia. I used to fly to Australia for 18 hours. So I'd spend more time flying there than back, uh, than, than I spent on the ground because wow. I didn't want to be away from my kids. And every, to me, every, every bedtime was like treasure. And I'm sitting in Australia and this reporter's asking me, you know, a bunch of questions about the site and about the experience. And we just launched our, our uh, office there. And he's like, oh man, your kids must think you're the coolest dad in the world. Da, 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 da. And, and I gave him kind of a pat answer, like out oh, of them, I'm just dad. I'm just goofy. I'm just a nerd. I, you know, kind of, but what really hit me in that moment was like, I haven't actually seen my kids for like two weeks. Cause I was like bopping around all over the place. And I actually feel like kind of a shitty dad right now. And I realized that this, this website that I'm running around the world talking about building for my kids is actually turning me into a really shitty father. And I, I didn't want to do that. I, I'd, I'd been saying yes to millions of kids around the world on behalf of them and been saying no to my own two kids for, for way too long. And, um, and so that's when I, I knew, okay, I had to, I had to be done. Now this had, this was about a year and a half before. So it took me 18 months. I built a succession plan. I found my successor. We did a proper transition. I wanted to make sure that my baby was in good hands. And, um, and then I went back to spend some more time with my actual babies and, and focus on the community. And I, and I, you know, this community, I truly believe club penguin wouldn't have been able to be launched anywhere else, at least not the same way. Um, the amount of empathy, the amount of heart, the amount of passion. I mean, you've been here a couple months now. Dude, how do you, I mean, even the, 
the fact that a, a, maybe back then it was 120,000 people or 100,000 people um, to build that kind of company here just doesn't make sense. No, no. But but if I were to have built it somewhere else, it would have been so much easier for uh, us to lose focus and us mm. to lose sight of what really mattered. When I, when we hired people, you know, the way we could hire so quickly and keep the values so oriented and so con- consistent um, was because we hired people that genuinely cared about kids. And so we were hiring people who had been like, like literally our, our online events planner. I mean, first of all, we're hiring jobs that didn't exist. Yeah. So you're saying we're- Nobody's trained for this. No though. one's trained for this. It's not like we can go, you know, grab someone, even if we were in the Bay Area, we couldn't grab someone from the company down the street who was doing holding virtual events and parties. Like that just wasn't happening. Literally, Facebook was being worked on by Mark Zuckerberg at Harvard the same time that we had launched Club Penguin. So it's not even like social networking was a thing really at that point. MySpace was kind of starting to come up around the same time, but that was it. And so we what did we do? We just found whatever the parallel was in life. So we needed someone to manage customer support create, great, great customer service experience. We hired, I hired the local manager from my Starbucks who I, I would drive 10 minutes further than I needed to, to go way. there because every time I went, the experience was, I mean, Starbucks runs a great shop and they normally are known for their customer care, but this guy just ran such an amazing, uh, shop team and, team shop, yeah. and, and everyone was all trained and, and it was so consistent. I said, that's what I want. So I hired him out. You know, he now uh, runs all of customer care for King. Um, it does like, you know, Candy Crush, or not King, sorry, Supercell, who does all the, uh, you know, mobile games. Um, he was doing, uh, running a bunch of safety stuff for Facebook. He ended up having three or 400 people reporting underneath him. Wow. Um, and he continued he through the ranks from Starbucks. And, and brought him in from Starbucks. You know, no college degree, just, just I think actually, no, he might have had like a certificate or something. Yeah. But um, so that was Starbucks. So that was customer care. For our events and creative um, uh, experiences, we hired people from summer camps, local summer camps. Who, what were they doing? They were running events for kids. They were, they were creating fun events for kids. They were just doing it in the real world. And we said, come do the same thing you've been doing. Dream up these fun ideas, but we're going to do it virtually and we're going to have some different tools to work with. Um, and so, and all these people ended up staying with the company and growing with it. And it's crazy. So you don't think any other city would have allowed you to build Club Penguin the way that you guys could build it here. I think I don't think it would have had the same heart if mm. it was built anywhere else. Yeah. And I've traveled the world. I'm a dual citizen. I've lived in a lot of places. I'm not throwing shade at any place. That you know, every place has their own DNA yeah. and their own strengths and weaknesses. I think one of the things that's unique about um, unique about this town and unique about the the culture that we had here was was this overwhelming desire to serve others, to care about people, to care about others, um, to care about these kids. And the empathy to build on behalf of someone else. You know, I, I again, I've got a lot of friends like in the Bay Area. They're awesome. It's a great place to build companies, but it does turn into a bit of a bro fest sometimes, yeah. where it's like, hey, you're, we're solving twenty something problems with twenty something solutions, and we're gonna build, you know, and all of a sudden they're growing big companies, and it's amazing. If I were to, even today to go say I want to build a kids website anywhere in the world, you know, I wouldn't be going to. Bay Area. I love it, but I wouldn't be there. I wouldn't be down in LA. I wouldn't be down. You know, you no. kind of have to find, find that the right community fit. and culture. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I know a lot of companies have been spawned. It's almost like the, you know, the PayPal mafia in the Bay Area, the Club Penguin mafia. Like there's just <laughs> literally sprinkled uh, companies that were, that were inspired, uh, minimum inspired, but definitely came from the Club Penguin team. Um, when you came back to decide to do the community stuff, how did you decide what to say yes to? Yeah. Well, so I knew a couple things. Number one, I knew the opportunity that Dave and the trust that Dave had put in us um, was not what was unique, was not normal. And so I wanted to do the same for others that Dave had done for us. So I knew I wanted to invest in some other startups, some other companies, you know, not just in tech, but you know, frankly, anywhere that I could find someone who was creative and passionate and wanted to, you know, build something great, um, I was going to provide some seed capital for that. Um, and so Wheelhouse, Wheelhouse was born to do that. Um, I was in, I also wanted to volunteer some time and, um, I had a couple friends who were on the board of Accelerate Okanagan, our local accelerator. Um, they were trying to help startups and they were working out of this, you know, no offense, but crappy little space down the block the here. Startups do, yeah. Yeah. And it was like, and I, I, so I said, listen, I'll serve one term on the board. Um, I'll kind of pay my dues a little bit. I, you know, I'm ta- talking about how I want to give back to the community. 
this is an area that I can lend some expertise Vote to. Your time, That's the yeah. other thing. Yeah. Is I didn't want to go do stuff again for my own ego or what, like, I, if I couldn't add value, I didn't want to do it. And this was an area I thought I could add some value. So I dug into it. One of the first things that came, became apparent was the, the budget, which is government funded, 80% of the budget was going to that space and to help subsidize space for some of these startups to be in. And 20% was going towards programming and creating, you know, helping entrepreneurs learn how to be entrepreneurs. Um, and I had experienced, you know, the loneliness of entrepreneurship. Lance had experienced the loneliness of entrepreneurship. And we talked all the time about, we, you know, people, some people thought it was like a rite of passage. Like, well, yeah, entrepreneurship has to be lonely. It just is. And I didn't think that was the case. I just thought, you know, there wasn't necessarily a great space for it. So we noticed this problem. Uh, I then had, thankfully, um, you know, amazing people, uh, Jeff Keen and, you know, yeah. who you know, uh, amazing people around us and also enough clout to be able to make some of the phone calls we did. And we ended up getting, you know, the vice chancellor of the university, the president of the college, uh, the mayor, uh, all of our local politicians, um, everyone around a table one night. And we said, listen, we want to make this a tech hub in Canada. Um, we've studied, you know, we studied Boulder, we studied Waterloo, we studied, you know, the Bay Area, obviously, Seattle, all these other tech hubs. Um, we looked at ones that obviously were a little bit smaller. So Boulder was kind of the closest parallel in terms of city size yeah. for what we wanted to do. And we said, you know, what, what did they do 20 years ago, you know, uh, when computers were first coming out? Well, number one, they were intentional. They, they were purposeful in, in a few actions that led to some bigger results. So what could those actions look like? A lot of ideas came out of that. Um, and, you know, I can point to that first meeting, but what was most amazing is that we met about 20 more times with that same group. That's and, crazy. And it was truly the, every key leader from this community showed up every single time to talk about how do we make this happen? And I think that's the key, you know, and people have said, Hey, we want to, we want to do the same thing. L listen, it was a lot of work, a lot of ups and downs. A lot of times we thought it wasn't going to happen. But most of all, what really pulled us through was the fact that we were genuinely w cheering each other on and working on it together. And, and it was a community effort. I mean, we had all three levels of government involved, um, which has never happened before. We, we handed all of our documentation over to the government to say, go, go do this in other cities. Here's everything we learned. Here's you kind of open sourced it. We'll, of course, yeah, because I'd love to see this, you know, building like this in other and, places. And what is the stats of this building, square footage? Yeah, it's about give people a sense of the visuals that may not be. Yeah, able to so it's about 120, 130,000 square feet. So it's yeah. seven, six stories with a rooftop uh, restaurant and uh, and big open outdoor area. area. It's just yeah. beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So the goal behind that again was to, um, it was something that I learned at Pixar. Frankly, uh, in fact, if you ever get a chance to, or just look up Pixar's uh, campus, I've been it's when Steve Jobs was because uh, you know Steve Jobs founded it when he during his time away from Apple. Um, they've got this incredible atrium in, in Emeryville, the, in the, in the Emeryville campus. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the secrets behind that is that in that atrium, and this is one of Steve Jobs requirements. So he was kind of instrumental in building out that campus. Um, he said, I want two things centrally located. I want food. All the food in the entire campus is only going to be located here. And the only bathrooms at the time in the entire campus are only going to be located here in this atrium because it's going to force people to get out of their desks, to, to, to leave their computer and interact with one another. And what are the places they do that? Well, bathroom is going to draw people out and food's going to draw people out. And so it was a very intentional desire to build that kind of bring that right collisions. brain and left brain together, build yeah. collisions. So we have an atrium running through this building uh, very intentionally. It's a huge waste of real estate. And 100% we told, waste of real estate. We were told over and over again Don't what do a huge it. waste of re yeah. real estate it was. But we wouldn't have been authentic to our vision of building community and building collisions if we didn't have that open space. Because otherwise, what do you do? You jump into an elevator, the elevator doors close, and the rest of the building is you're blind to at that point. It, all the rest of it disappears. We built a space where we wanted people to see each other from opposite floors and be able to wave at Dude, each other. I, I watched it. I think it's a, the floor underneath. Fifth floor is a guy doing architecture drawings all the time. Like, I don't know yeah. him, but I feel like I know him because I see him do his work all the totally. time. Totally. It's one of the reasons why almost all of the... We actually like helped glass. subsidize the, the, the build-outs, the TI build-outs, and... Um, and gave increased subsidies for glass because we wanted it to feel open. We wanted you to be able to see and interact with people. Listen, the moment we disappear behind our screens, and we're, we're experiencing this, you know, obviously, and, and have uh, with COVID and, and more remote work, the moment it's so easy to disappear behind your screen and lose sight of that personal connection. And so we wanted to build a space where that, that, didn't, that, that could happen naturally and freely. 
Um, and I also believe that better companies are going to be coming out as a result of it, right? Mm. I mean, you've, you, you, you know the age-old story, the, the invention of the I, iPod, the original iPod that Apple came out with, which, you know, arguably was the, was the predecessor to the iPhone and predecessor to the iPad and one of the reasons why Apple's, you know, most valuable company in the world today. Um, that came about from a, you know, two guys coming from different departments, one who had just seen this, you know, this presentation about this new little hard drive that I think Toshiba or Fujitsu or someone had just come out with, uh, meeting up with someone who had just been tasked to build a MP3 player, or, you know, build, build a device that could hold a thousand songs was like, you know, the Steve Jobs requirement or something like that. And they were like, almost kind of complaining to each other, like, oh, I, I've got this impossible task. Where the hell am I ever going to find? And this guy's like, well, I just came into this wasted presentation because they made this brick that will never fit in a laptop. And and we don't need small size for a desktop. So what a waste of a hard drive design, you know? And it's like, wait a minute. And ba -ba 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 -ba, one thing leads to another, and the iPod is born. And that came out of a collision that was not in a meeting, that was not by design, that was not management-led, that was not organized and formulated. It came out of a collision of a conversation of two folks griping about, you know, their day, frankly, yeah. and 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 ending up That's birthing an incredible, happens. incredible magic. Yeah. So we're out of doing all this stuff because you definitely don't lead a uh, timid life. So busy, lots of demands. Why or how did you come to the decision to be a dragon? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well. Um, Boy, uh, so they had actually reached out while I was still at Disney. Okay. And remember I said, if you weren't Mickey Mouse or one of my kids, you weren't going to hear from me. 100%. So, and it, you know, people like to overly glamorize it. Like, oh, they reached out. They asked me to be a dragon. No, yeah. they didn't. They asked yeah. if I'd be willing to audition. And, and that's every, it happens every time that there's a new dragon. There's a whole audition process. Um, the amount of times, by the way, at dinner parties that people are like, oh, I was asked to be a dragon. I was asked to be a dragon. I've you know? had three or four friends say that. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, you might have been asked to audition, but you were asked along with about 50 to 100 other people, right? Yeah. And that's what, so they had asked me to audition uh, seven years ago, eight years ago now. Um, and, and I said, no, I said I couldn't. Because again, I was already uh, traveling too much. I was already feeling guilty about my kids. Um, and the idea of spending, you know, three weeks a year in Toronto straight, um, uh, without my kids was just, I didn't have the time for it. Uh, so I said no. And, and, and honestly, I'd regretted it a little bit cause I thought, man, that'd be fun. Like I, anyone who knows me, I, I definitely, I was never diagnosed, but I probably have ADHD and, yeah, you do. and, and scattered <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and love to take on a lot of different things, uh, love new challenges. So I was always a little bit bummed about that one. You know, fast forward, uh, this building had just completed. We had just moved in. Um, I, you know, was still managing some investments, doing some advising, um, helping out a startup that I'd, I'd helped found but wasn't running at the time. Um, and the they, they called again. And actually, my assistant almost ignored it, thinking it was a prank call. Because we get prank calls all the Dude, time. Yeah. It, or it's like some weird random person. And you're like, you're not even connected to this thing. Yeah. yeah, like sometimes these emails don't even make sense because it's a production company yeah. or whatever. Yeah. yeah, and and part of my EA's role is vetting like stuff to pass on to me. Yeah, and uh, and and so um, she almost threw it away. It was actually one of you know one of the other folks working for me at the time who's like, wait a minute, Lane mentioned that this happened once. Like I heard him at you know some dinner conversation bring it up. It might actually be legit. So then she dives into it. Turns out it was legit. Uh, I went to an audition and I thought at the time I thought, oh, I was so honored and so excited and, and maybe I might be auditioning just with like four or five people. Um, and I got there and I was only auditioning with four or five people. So I'm like, all right, you know, 20, 25 percent chance this could work. Uh, what I found out later was that that was only one of like four Batches. auditions they held in Vancouver. And then they held another like five or six of those sessions in Toronto and, um, yeah, so when I learned that even on the day of, I'm like, Hey, this was fun. I, you know, popped out to Vancouver for the day, got to pretend like I was a dragon with five other guys, a couple of my new, you know, uh, Ryan Holmes and a few yeah. folks out there who were great guys. Uh, and so it was fun. It was a fun experience. You know, uh, I get a call back about a week later. Hey, can you come out to Toronto and do this again? Um, I did, I didn't have to do the full, you know, we did a full like two to three hour pitch session with a bunch of different pictures and it's like real full cameras. Real deals, yeah. It was a real deal. Uh, I, I went out there, didn't have to do the full thing. Um, met with some of the more senior people again. I was just then shortlisted. And I think that I, it was one of like five or six at that point. And, and, uh, got a call a few days later saying, Hey, if you're interested, 
what was the motivation? Like, what did you see as, as an opportunity for, I mean, I know it's, it's probably not a deal flow thing. Like, I mean, no, no, it's not deal flow. And it, and it, uh, you know, <laughs> to be, I am investing my own money yeah. and, and, uh, and I'm, they don't pay us a ton of money. And I, again, I'm not complaining. It's a couple weeks worth of work, but it's not extravagant. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but for me, um, for me, it's an opportunity to help raise awareness for entrepreneurship. Um, I was so fortunate to have gone through like almost a fast forward experience. You know, I, I felt like it, you know, when I was leaving Disney at 30, I would have been 32, 33 years old when I was leaving, uh, maybe 34. Um, I had gone from starting a company, hiring the first four employees, hiring then three to 400 employees there, then hiring globally then moving my way up, and I ultimately ended up overseeing a bunch of the different studios within Disney. When I left, there was about, I think about 1,500 people reporting into me in, in some form or fashion. And I was the youngest executive vice president of the company. Um, I had incredible mentors. I made a ton of mistakes. Yeah, you know, I, it's one thing, like, I'm not saying this because it was like, wow, I, I was so good that this just happened. I, I was good enough. You worked at but, it. But I worked at it, and I also made a lot of mistakes, and there's a lot of patience thrown at me, um, and I'm thankful for that. So when I'm at a stage in my life where I've got health, I've got some wealth, I've got opportunity, I've got a crazy experience, you know, to, to end up in like a Fortune, I think at the time, Fortune 10, Fortune, 10, Fortune yeah. 20 company. Um, and have been on that roller coaster and like fast forwarded through that in five years was uh, was unique. And I thought there's no reason. My first job was at Disneyland. That was one of the other kind of fun things of this. So I still remember the first time I set foot into Bob Iger's office, the CEO. Yeah. Um, while we were negotiating this deal, and um, and I just was like, I'd almost pinch myself, going, "Man, like I never imagined." Like you worked at Disneyland, your first job as a teenager. Yeah, at 16 years old. Because you grew up in the U.S. Yeah. So it was literally 12 years later. I'm sitting in the CEO's office negotiating the sale of my you company. Can't make this stuff up. No, no. And and from that point on, then going to board meetings with board members of the Walt Disney Company, including Steve Jobs and these others, and like having just this mind blowing. Like I'm just all I can say is I was filled with awe, humility, gratitude. Um, and I felt like imposter syndrome all the time as well, all the way through this experience. But, you know, with a lot of time, a lot of therapy and a lot of, uh, you know, kind of processing, I realized, okay, rather than just like, hey, how can I now pivot this into an even bigger thing for me? I'm like, listen, who knows? Like, I'm not against doing other cool things, but, but I almost felt a responsibility to say, how can I, how can I help others experience a journey like this? How can I make it a little bit easier for them to experience a journey like this? And, um, and so I, you know, we, we built some infrastructure here in the innovation center. Um, AO, by the way, the, the end of that story is accelerate Okanagan. Um, their budget is now inverted. So 20% of their budgets going to the operation estate, and the real yeah. estate costs and 80% is going to help other startups, which is one of the reasons why this building is full, even throughout COVID, um, it, it's remained at full capacity. Um, because, the the health of the startup community and the tech community here and and uh, and I'm I'm again I, and I'm not taking credit for that now everyone is really I mean we've got an amazing infrastructure here um, but but Dragons Den was an opportunity to take some of those lessons to an even bigger level and bigger and audience. and be able to encourage entrepreneurship not just in my hometown but encourage entrepreneurship um, nationally mm -hmm. and and meet people from all around the world or all around I should say all around Canada all across Canada hear incredible stories, learn from them, um, share a little bit of what I've learned. Hang out with Jim. Hang out with Jim. Dude, I love that stud. guy. He's a stud. Jim is the real deal. I mean, they're all, they're all amazing. Don't get me yeah, wrong. But Jim Jim's I, the OG. Jim, I told you this, like Jim is the grandfather I wish I would have had because yeah. he's just so wise and seasoned. Yeah. And Jim is truly one of those guys because I'm guilty of it too. And so many people are guilty of like, you, you manage your time, you know, you're trying to like, I don't want to waste time. You know, sometimes people want to talk and it's like, listen, I got 15 other things I'm late for right now. I got to go. Jim is the guy who will stop and kind of fold his arms and he's usually towering over people because he's like six, five yeah. and he'll just, he'll talk your off. You want to talk hockey? We'll talk hockey. You want to talk business? We'll talk business. You know, and he, he just, he has time for everyone. And that's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing trait. I, I want to be Jim when I grow up. Something to admire. Yeah. Um, 
as we wrap up, Lane, uh, I love to ask everybody, you know, looking back, you know, from the 19, 20 year old version of you to the person that sits here today, you know, you mentioned uh, a lot of therapy, a lot of lessons learned. Who have you had to become to be the person that's achieved this level of success? Hmm. It's a great question. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, I had to become someone who, who I had to become someone who knew it wasn't about me. And I see that mistake a lot with entrepreneurs. You know, they, they, they're so passionate about their idea. They're so excited about their idea. They end up kind of just wrapping this idea around them and it might work for a time. They might even have some success with it. Um, but then it starts to mess with succession. Then it starts to mess with, um, uh, with workflow and, and, and getting in their own way. It starts to mess with their heads. It starts to mess with their families. It starts to mess with their friends. Um, cause in success, it can be incredibly enticing. Um, and in failure, it can be incredibly defeating if it's all about you. I think the best thing that I did, number one, is I had great partners who reminded me daily it wasn't about me. And so that was helpful. Um, um, people say Lance and I used to fight like an old married couple. Uh, um, but we always respected each other. Like we'd always hug it out at the end. But, but when we were arguing about what the next experience should be for those kids and we were arguing on behalf of those kids, we were passionate about it because we were both very creative and we both really wanted to do the best we could for the kids. And, um, and so having that was amazing. Uh, having my own kids at the time reminded me every single night that it wasn't about me, yeah. that, you know, uh, that, that there's more to life than that. Um, and then having great friends who, who also didn't really give a shit. You know, I mean, I had some, I lost some friendships, of course, when, when the deal happened and all of a sudden they like woke up and, and I was this other thing to them. Um, and that was hard. And that's just, that's the nature of it sometimes. And it's, I, I don't blame them. You know, who knows what, and I don't even know who knows what their experience was with money as kids mm -hmm. or their experience with, with money is now today. Um, I had, I had one who wrote me a letter who literally was like, it's not you, it's me, but I just need to pause on this for about a year. Um, because it's too hard for me to be around you with this success right now. And I get it. And I, you know, it was almost like and the irony was I got the worst grades out of all my siblings. I, my siblings used to joke about whose couch I was going to be sleeping on as, as I got older because my grades were so bad Yeah, and I was so distracted at school and I was so, um, you know, I was, I was focused on art and creativity. So I'm like, I was the last person anyone around me thought this would happen to. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why it happened, but it's also been a reminder for me that it really wasn't about me. My uncle was an MP for, for 12, 15 years, something like that in Alberta, member of parliament. And he, um, I asked him, I'm like, man, how do you go from being a farmer one day? Cause he was, you know, dairy farmer and grew Alberta, up running yeah. the farm. How do you go from being a farmer one day to like flying with the snowbirds or flying in an F-18 in Cold Lake, uh, in these crazy experiences and, and being, he was a minister of transportation for quite a while as well under Harper. And I said, how do you like, how do you make sense of that? And he said, he said, Lane, I remind myself every single day that the power is with the seat and the chair I'm sitting in. The power is not mine. I happen to be lucky enough to be sitting there for now. Someday I won't be, I'll be sitting back in a tractor and someone else will be sitting there. And as long as I remind myself every day that it's not about me, that the power is about the seat and, and, and not about me when I have to leave eventually, uh, it won't be so hard and, uh, and I'll be able to graciously hand it off to the next person, um, because it was never about me in the first place. And that, that's, uh, that really stuck with me. And I try to remind myself that every day. Some, some wise words, um, for the ones that are listening that want to reach out and thank you for the inspiration, where's the best way for them to find you online? Um, I've got a website, lanemerryfield.com. Uh, so you just have to figure out how to spell my name. Yeah. <laughs> um, try Google. You yeah, know, exactly. I'm correct. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm on Instagram and stuff. I, I just use my same handle for everything. So it's all Lane Merrifield. Thankfully it's a unique enough name that, uh, no one else took it. Yeah. Yeah. It's always available. Um, so fun fact, as we uh, close up Lane, I wouldn't be here if you didn't build this building. Hmm. Because this building uh, houses the two of my favorite people, Matt and Brad at Pila. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I came out for Brad's 25th uh, wedding anniversary last year with my little boy. 
and I just fell in love with Kelowna. And then this year, you know, with my wife, we kind of asked ourselves where we wanted to spend time. Yeah. And um, so how crazy is that, that when you sat down with those people so many years ago to design this epicenter to attract people, and I know, um, you know, MetaBridge has played a big part bringing people here, yeah. um, that that would be the case. So I'm, I'm sure if my, my family was here, they'd say thank you. Cause I love it. No, listen, man. It's that, cool, nothing, man. Nothing warms my heart more than to hear that because that was what we set out to do. You know, we, we didn't have to build any of these pieces. The pieces were all there. They were just scattered across the city. So we said, well, why don't we just concentrate it together and see what happens? And, um, and that, I love hearing that, man. Thank you for sharing that. And, and thanks for coming out here. Dude, I, super cool. The, the city, uh, when, I, when I heard that this was uh, going to be more than a temporary, uh, temporary setup, Man, I was so happy, and I'm, I'm happy for you and your family because I raised my kids here, and it's an incredible place to do that. Um, but you know, even more than that, I'm happy for this community because, uh, dude, you're a rock star, man. It's an easy place to do life. Appreciate yeah. you, Lane. You too, my friend. <laughs>